Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākinekina ki a uta, ki a mātaratara ki tai, i hia ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei muri ora. Tēnā tātou katoa, ko Fleur Te Aho Toko Ingoa, he uri a hau o Ngāti Mutinga. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Fleur Tiapo and I'm a member of the Aotearoa New Zealand Centre for Indigenous Peoples and the Law. Uh, this session is part of a series that's been led by the Māori Law Review with support from the Aotearoa New Zealand Centre for Indigenous Peoples and the Law. And the series is looking at the experiences of Indigenous peoples um, in the context of COVID-19 um, and the governmental responses uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and in particular, what the series is aiming to do is to pick up on issues of law and justice, giving those terms law and justice a really broad understanding. Uh, in today's session, we're focusing in on the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples in Australia, um, our neighbours across the Tasman. And we have two really excellent panellists um, lined up to speak today. Um, so I'm, I'm very delighted to share this online space um, with these two strong, brilliant Aboriginal wahine who are here with us. So I'm going to introduce our two panellists to you uh, and then they'll each have an opportunity to share some reflections on the topic uh, before we move into a short discussion to pick up on some of the key issues. So I'm going to introduce our two panellists to you uh, in the order that they're going to be speaking. Um, so first we're going to hear from Alison Whitaker. So Alison is a Gomoroi poet and a legal researcher from the floodplains of Ganada in New South Wales. She's currently um, a senior researcher at um, Jambana, which is the Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology in Sydney. She was a Fulbright Scholar at Harvard Law School back in 2017 to 2018, where she was named the Dean Scholar in Race, Gender and Criminal Law. Her second book, Black Work, was released with Magabala Books in September 2018. Um, and that book has been described as a stunning mix of memoir, reportage, fiction, satire and critique. Um, prior to this, Alison worked at Centre for the Advancement of Indigenous Knowledges at UTS, UTS Law, and the Gendered Violence Research Network, and has received a Black and Right Fellowship from the State Library of Queensland. So a very happy welcome to you, Alison. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so our second uh, speaker is Professor Larissa Berendt. Uh, Larissa is a Uiliai Kamilaroi woman. She is the Professor of Law and Director of Research at the Jambana Indigenous House of Learning at UTS. Uh, she's admitted as a Barrister of the Supreme Court of ACT in New South Wales and she holds numerous additional prestigious appointments, um, including as a Land Commissioner at the Land and Environment Court and as the alternate chair of the Serious Offenders Review Board. Um, at the same time as publishing extensively academically, Larissa is also a celebrated novelist and she hosts a radio show on Radio National and ABC local radio called Speaking Out, uh, which considers um, some salient issues in politics, arts and culture from a range of Indigenous perspectives. And that's included some very powerful commentary on COVID-19 related issues. So um, a very warm welcome to you also, um, Larissa. Great to be here, thanks. <laughs> So um, welcome to both of our panellists. Um, again, thank you um, for very generously agreeing to participate in today's session. Um, and with that, I'm just going to pass over to our first uh, speaker, Alison. So it's all yours. Thank you so much for um, Yama, everybody listening. Uh, as it said, I'm Alison Whitaker, I'm a Gomorrah woman. Um, I grew up on country in the Namoi, uh, which is a river in northern New South Wales. Um, currently, I live on Mongol country, um, but I'm yarning to you today from my office on beautiful Gadigal country. Um, I want to take a moment before we begin uh, to acknowledge Gadigal elders and ancestors um, who continue to hold sovereignty over this country, uh, to also hold uh, everybody who is on this country. Um, thank you so much, Fleur, for having me. It's a real honour to be yarning with you from the Aotearoa Centre for Indigenous Peoples and the Law, um, but also from the Māori Law Review, whose work I've admired from across the sea um, for, for quite some time. Uh, if you'd asked me what impact coronavirus would have had on our communities in March, I can't say I would have anticipated that it would have turned out the way that it has. So. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people alike have contracted the virus and spoken about it publicly, um, albeit have contracted the virus in relatively small numbers. Um, 
which is probably the, the smaller element of uh, the coronavirus's impact on our mob. Um, the relative protection that we've had from COVID-19, the virus, um, has effectively been, uh, as Darren Bullen, South Sea Island uh, scholar uh, and researcher, uh, Amy McGuire has said, it's the result of community-controlled Aboriginal health organisations. Um, and Aboriginal health workers who have been really deliberate in seeing health justice uh, as a sovereignty issue um, and acting in a self-determining way to protect their communities during this crisis. Um, unfortunately, although probably not surprisingly to anybody who's watching or listening, um, settler legal systems here have not done so well by Aboriginal people during this crisis or Torres Strait Islander people for that matter. Um, especially in the realms of criminal law, imprisonment and police, um, which is what I was invited to come and have a yarn with you about today. Uh, it's manifested in really surprising and multifaceted ways that, again, we really couldn't have predicted. And so I'm going to try and take you across the, the breadth of that impact today. Um, if it's a bit overwhelming, I'm sure we can <laughs> unpack a bit of it later in conversation. Um, in March, we were quite terrified of um, large scale outbreaks in prisons um, as early on cases began to seed in key prisons on the East Coast. Um, we know that prisons are conditions in which coronavirus would wreak havoc, having seen what they've done in comparative jurisdictions. Everyone is in close quarters. Uh, there's limited scope for seeking independent uh, medical advice or support. Um, many mob inside already have pre-existing conditions that made them vulnerable to illness under the virus, um, and lockdown measures as well that would have been initiated to protect people uh, or quarantine them inside also posed their own risk um, to the people that they were imposed on and their already strained rights in Australia. Um, a campaign ran in the early stages of uh, lockdown, which was called Clean Out Prisons, and its core ask was to get all mob out of prison and get them into their homes or into safe accommodations. And the campaign was led um, by First Nations families who'd lost loved ones inside, um, but also families who still had loved ones inside who were concerned about their welfare. And this campaign was supported by uh, Indigenous legal services and of course, Indigenous legal scholars. Uh, and the campaign itself had a lot of difficulty garnering media attention compared to non-Indigenous criminologists uh, and corrective services themselves. Um, despite the sources that were managing to get stories out, um, were telling us of mass lockdowns inside cells with people not able to leave at all, um, guards threatening to, to make people clean cells of suspected cases as punishment. Um, but also people being dragged um, away into solitary um, in front of their peers if they've reported symptoms. Um, so something that's important to note in this context is um, there was a reduction in the prison population uh, of Australia, of about 5% in the last quarter between March and June. Uh, and the South East in Victoria and New South Wales uh, were the principal contributors to that. So each um, of Victoria and New South Wales reduced their prison population by about 8%. Um, so while that's significant, um, and for us it's rare to see a reduction in the prison population, uh, it's actually for sure not enough, um, especially in the proportion of First Nations women who were released, which was not significant given that they have been the driving force um, that has seen our population soar in prisons recently. Uh, it looks like most of that decrease in the prison population is attributable to the release of unsentenced mob in prison. Uh, and the Indigenous prisoner population itself reduced by about 5%, uh, which is the first national decrease uh, of Aboriginal people in prison and in Torres Strait Islander people in prison um, for a very long time. Certainly, I don't think I've been alive to see it. Um, I don't think, despite this relatively sharp drop um, in people being um, physically put into prison. I don't think there's any reason for us to expect that change to be in the longer term. Um, the infrastructure of criminalisation in Australia under COVID um, seems to kind of expand almost every day um, with increasingly punitive, um, and as I'll talk about later, militarised uh, police force um, to enforce public health orders. Um, and also as state 
and territory governments begin to respond to the recession um, that is happening under COVID. It's looking like um, the building and rebuilding and expansion of prisons is actually core on their agenda, or it certainly is in Victoria. Um, part of the difficulty of the systematic release of people from prison um, was that it wasn't really done in a systematic way that was clearly conveyed to people who were inside. There was a lot of early panic um, there wasn't clear communication about how one applies to get out or what the process would be or who was excluded. Um, and there was a, a near unilateral control over releases that were passed to ministers. Um, and they were passed on mostly during um, this early flurry of COVID regulations without parliamentary oversight. Um, and it was quite confusing. Um, for lawyers to be able to understand. So I can only imagine how difficult it would be for people who didn't have that extensive leading legal training um, to understand on what circumstances they could be released uh, from effectively a pathogenic <laughs> circumstance. Um, there's still no data on who has been released under what. So whether um, people who were on remand have been released through bail applications or if they are released through this discretionary power. Um, so it's difficult for us to assess just what the impact of that was um, or if there's any role in community pressure to mass decarcerate people in this crisis. Um, for those who haven't been released from prison, um, the situation here is quite grim. Uh, prisons are, for the most part, in lockdown. Um, there's very little information going in, there's very little information coming out. Um, no visits from family have been allowed uh, since early March, which is, it has an unfathomable impact on people who are inside, and also those who love people who are inside. Uh, for some youth prisons on the East Coast um, that have had small outbreaks in recent months, um, they've been effectively kept in solitary um, as a preventative measure, um, which of course raises really profound human rights concerns um, and is going to have a devastating impact uh, on a whole generation of Indigenous kids. Um, research in Sydney by Deadly Connections, which is a um, community prisoner advocacy organisation, um, suggests that the mental health and well-being of families on the outside who are looking in and anticipating the well-being of their loved ones inside has been quite adversely impacted as well by the pandemic. So there's a reverberating impact on the conditions of prison uh, for mob on the outside as well. Um, and not quite in response to this, but at the same time, so it's difficult to not address this as a, a COVID issue, um, but Black Lives Matter here emerged um, after some really long years of campaigning uh, by First Nations people on deaths in custody. Um, on June 5, a large rally in Sydney was denied approval, um, only to have that police declaration overturned at the last second on June 6, uh, while tens of thousands of people were already in the process of rallying uh, what was then an unauthorised um, gathering. Um, it went largely smoothly, but that night, around Central Station, which in Sydney is the, the main way that most people would get home. Uh, crowds were dwindling and predominantly um, Aboriginal and African people, uh, young people especially, were remaining. Um, police formed a line uh, and pushed them underground into the Central Station tunnels um, where they then used pepper spray without warning, which resulted in um, injuries and hospitalizations. The protesters who were affected are currently seeking damages, um, but internal police investigations concluded that the use of, uh, use of force was within the power of police at the time. Um, and not long after June 6, um, prisoners at Long Bay Prison, um, which is notorious here for being the place where David Dungay Jr. Uh, passed away, um, were so heavily pepper sprayed during their own action um, that people in surrounding suburbs were advised to go inside. Uh, and when drones went over for footage, um, they saw four young Aboriginal men spelling out um, BLM with shirts. So this movement isn't just isolated to people on the outside, but um, people who are incarcerated are having their voice heard as well. Um, in subsequent Black Lives Matter protests, which are happening at a really strange time uh, in the law here with uh, COVID regulation overtaking what we anticipate to be much of protest rights here. Uh, we've seen really strange enforcement um, 
um, like aggressive police protection of one particular Captain Cook statue in Sydney um, and police outnumbering protesters in many actions uh, two to one. Um, we've also seen the use of long range acoustic devices um, at protests around the Captain Cook statue. Um, and again, these are impacting mostly young Aboriginal and African people. Um, and despite restrictions otherwise opening up here in New South Wales, um, there still remains a restriction on outdoor gatherings to less than 20 people, um, which is bizarre in our circumstance. Um, it has been speculated that that is to prevent protest activity happening. Um, so yes, it's pretty overall quite bleak here. Um, COVID hasn't necessarily created um, new problems uh, for mob who are incarcerated or mob who are policed, um, but it's certainly an intensification of systems that have already been around for a long time um, in different innovations or by different names. Um, and so we are learning to deal with them now that they have this new face. Thank you, Alison. That's very um, powerful and provocative uh, and a lot. Some of it resonates with what's going on here and, and some of it, of course, I've seen in the news, like the, <laughs> the police protection units around that Captain Cook statue, which is, you know, you'd laugh if you didn't cry. Um, but yeah, some of it is, is wholly new information to me. So really striking to hear about these young kids, especially being kept in solitary purportedly as a precautionary measure for them. But yeah, just a, a real worry. So it would be really interesting to come back um, in the discussion time and maybe pick up on some of these points. But thank you so much for your very powerful um, cordial. So uh, now we'll turn to hear from Professor Larissa Brent. So Larissa, take it away. Thanks, Flo, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I just also want to acknowledge that I'm also on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and join Alison in paying my respects to Elders past and present and um, acknowledging the sovereignty and the generosity with which they share the land and ensure that the cultural knowledges of this place remain strong. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge the great work that Alison's been doing in this space as well. Um, you know, obviously, it's clear from her comments that she's been right across this. Her research has really been important in terms of being able to articulate a systemic abuse of power by police that's particularly um, been taking protesters. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge, although Alison didn't mention it herself, that she's done an enormous amount of work to ensure that people who wanted to exercise their rights to protest were protected and knew, um, you know, what they could do if that happened. So she's been enormously proactive in this space and I want to acknowledge that really important work. Um, and just, you know, I think add one thing to the the powerful things she said, um, and she's, you know, I think given the clear um, undeniable case that there's been a, a way in which um, the police in New South Wales have used COVID, as they have in other states, but you know, obviously that's where we are, have used COVID as a way of trying to suppress protests. And that's particularly been around the Dungay case. It's important to note that part of the powerful protest coming from the community around that case has been because of the circumstances of that case, that there is a demand that there be charges laid. So the, and, and you know, the, the group of around, the family and the group supporting them have had legal advice that there is a case to answer. So there's very solid grounds for asking for that, um, that, um, that justice to be done. And that's, um, I think, been part of why um, this is um, being so targeted. It's targeted generally, and that's the, the case, as Alison says, and, and we've all seen the erroneous comments about, you know, the, the spread, when there's been spread of the virus that's been by protesters, and none of that's been true. So I want to just focus, um, actually, I'm picking up something else that Alison started um, her remarks with that I think is really critical. I'm going to talk a bit more about what's been happening in the health space. It's, um, uh, you know, obviously we work mostly in the legal space, but the health space is really intricate to that. As 
many people would know there's a real intersection between our health issues and our criminal justice issues in a range of ways. Um, but, you know, I, I also, you know, think that this is been an area where we've we've monitored closely for a range of reasons and i think as allison said really importantly COVID hasn't created um divisions in the community but it has shown and and magnified divisions that were already there um inequalities that were already there um differentiations that were already there and interestingly for me um in relation to sort of reflecting on uh, the great work the community controlled sectors done in this space that allison mentioned um i was actually uh doing quite a bit of work out at oak valley on the maralinga lands in very very remote south australia their health service at oak valley is the most remote community controlled health service in the state and so it was interesting to be sort of on the ground there to see how they were responding to the emerging issue um, and you know, interestingly their um, their aboriginal nurse there then um, who who works at the health service was very quick to call a community meeting to explain the discussion about this virus that was coming talk about um the importance of uh hygiene all of the things that were being said about how to prevent diseases but at that time as well the community was really preparing to shut itself down i think one of the things that the remoter communities had as a kind of advantage really was that they um had the ability to close their own communities down. I think it's really important to note that the the proactive steps that were taken to ensure that there were lower numbers in our Indigenous communities where there would have been an incredibly high risk if this had have been done wrong, came from the people working on the ground in those health services who knew the community, who knew how to get the community together and knew how to call the more vulnerable people in that community into a community meeting. Now, mainstream services never do that. Our community controlled services are very good at that. And it wasn't it wasn't um, state governments that were the first to move to try and close these communities. It was the communities themselves that understood um, what um, the implications would be if there was infection coming through. So I think that's really important. As Alison mentioned, this really speaks to a, a strong exercise of sovereignty by our communities. That ability to close off who's coming into your community is really important. So. Um, I, th I think we can exp explain um, the fact that it was so successfully dealt with in those communities by strong community controlled organisations, strong community controlled councils and strong community controlled health organisations. But what was also interesting was, of course, um, as communities decided they wanted to, to shut down, the, the, the challenges and, and the lack of um, other support given to those communities from governments became really highlighted. The need to get medical supplies in and particularly food. As, as many of you might know, one of the big issues facing our remoter communities is, um, is food security. And while communities of, like Oak Valley are very good at supplementing their diets with traditional food, um, they still you know, gather and hunt um, as a very important part of how they, they um, they live but they also rely heavily on community stores um, and fresh food is incredibly overpriced and rare and junk food is incredibly cheap and plentiful so um, i should say relatively nothing is cheap there i should say but it's relatively cheap so so those sorts of things became a really big issue and uh, particularly the community controlled health organizations and our national community controlled um, body, health organisation body, Nacho, um, and their um, CEO, uh, Pat Turner, were really proactive in raising awareness of that issue and uh, pushing governments to move to ensure that there was food security there. Um, so, I, you know, and, and, and those communities, of course, have had huge impacts in terms of the cutting off, being cut off from family, and, and there's huge movement between communities there. I mean, can, uh, ceremony in that part of Australia goes all the way from, from the top end right down to Sojourner. So it's a sweeping um, cere ceremonial um, song line there. And that meant that those things were, um, were, were also things that needed to be navigated. But I do think it's important to note that that story of the remote communities and the challenges they faced and how 
how um, they did the heavy lifting to get a good result is really just one part of the story. Most Indigenous people live in urban communities and so really are much more reliant in, in those areas. Um, we've got really good um, Aboriginal health services across the country, um, but you know, I think in some some places uh, there's 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 less of a um, a sense of supporting the indigenous community and and people are left to mainstream services. So, um, in that sense, the education campaigns that were put out by the community controlled health sector were really important. They were very strong about people getting their immunisations. The um, and, and also in terms of explaining in culturally appropriate ways through culturally appropriate means um, how people could protect themselves, um, the measures they could take to protect themselves and their families. And again, really difficult, I think, I think for particularly cultures like ours, um, for older people who are so revered to be cut off, um, the, the family gets togethers, the, the community interactions has been um, incredibly traumatizing as it is for everybody but i think there's also that that um being cut off from from the cultural connection can i think be really triggering to people who particularly through their their early life were subject to policies that were particularly controlling around not speaking language not talking to family not engaging in those kind of activities um, so i think what it has done is highlight how under-resourced um, some of our services are in those places that have large Aboriginal populations in the urban areas. And as, as, as some people might know, the largest Aboriginal population in Australia is actually in Western Sydney. And so, so I think give, it gives us a good benchmark of, um, you know, where um, uh, people will fall through the cracks because focus is on communities that are seen as being more remote or even even regional and there is quite distinct set of problems and issues within those urban areas so i guess one of the things i wanted to highlight was we see during this time that our community controlled services are doing the really heavy lifting if you want to look at the successes that allison and i have highlighted amongst um, the grim realities of COVID, they have really been attributed to our community our you know our, our community activists our community um, our families and also our community controlled organizations but they are still the most underfunded our health services are underfunded and of course our legal services are underfunded that intersection in the space where allison is working so diligently you know is is, is quite obvious and you know i guess um what um that highlights is not just the the fact that that funding needs to be fixed but that um, you know, that heavy lifting, that success in punching above their weight really goes rewarded. And I think one of the things that the sector continues to be, um, the community controlled sector in general, continues to be concerned about is that when we go through these periods um, that, and, and our community controlled um, organisations do the heavy lifting, as the crisis one hope starts to get behind us and we're going into a new era, era where there is significant rebuilding that additional resources for that rebuilding don't go to our community controlled organizations they go to the identified indigenous parts of mainstream services or a great bugbear of our community controlled sector and myself is that they go to non-indigenous ngo organizations and i think that's one thing that we're kind of really bracing uh, around is to really continue to tell that story about the success, the continual proof. I mean, we didn't need COVID to have evidence that our community controlled sector and our services in health, uh, education, um, employment, housing, and, uh, um, and, and the law give better outcomes. That data was already sitting there and this has just highlighted the effectiveness of community controlled strategies. So um, it continues to be a really important thing to ensure that that, um, that has, has been the case. Um, you know, recently there was a, a, re, um, a resetting of our Close the Gap um, national agenda, which is the, I guess, the government's own uh, scorecard on how they're doing on a range of um, priorities that they set for themselves. Um, and that it had been a, a dismal failure since it was set um, at, at the time of the um, apology by Kevin Rudd in 2007. Um, they've reset that. And while I think there's rightly some cynicism about um, the ability of the federal government to deliver in these areas. I think one thing that's been important is that the community controlled sector 
has a seat at the table. So at least in that sense, there is um, uh, some, some sense that things might be slightly different going forward. And I guess I just also perhaps in, in looking at this, wanted to make this observation that I think what you do see through these periods, again, is the continued resilience of um, Indigenous people that, um, that we see these moments of crisis come up and there is actually, you know, I think the swiftness with which a community like Oak Valley can respond and make its decisions and act um, is, you know, as we've said, a, a, an act of sovereignty, but there is a, a really strong sense of resilience. And, and in a way, although this has been a cataclysmic event in everyone's life, we've never seen anything like it. I think what's always interesting to me is that a lot of our older people see it as just one more cataclysmic thing that we look at and, and that sense that, you know, we've survived many other crises and, um, and my favourite, we've survived smallpox so we can <laughs> survive this, I think is actually, while it's sort of in a way our usual using humour to, to, um, to get through the dark times, I think there really is a strong uh, truth in that that needs to be embraced and acknowledged that actually, as Alison says, you can't look at our situation without thinking about the colonial framework in which we are. So every day, every day is a battle and every day is a fight. And even even the, the issues and the cases that have had a spotlight put on them from the Black Lives Matter movement gaining momentum in another country um, has only magnified the voices and the campaigns and the protests and the agendas that were already there, that we were already fighting, we were already seeking change, we were already um, in that position. So they were the main comments I wanted to make around the health space to complement what Alison had said. And then I thought um, I'd just make a couple of um, observations a bit more focused on the area of the arts as Alison and I both in various ways work in that, um, both in the, in, in the support of um, other creative practitioners, our own creative work, both being writers, both doing a range of other creative practices. And, um, because I think it's worth acknowledging that, um, you know, it's, it's an important part of, um, you know, our, our everyday life to be engaged in creative practice. And for some people, that's their livelihood. It's more than just obviously a job um, for us. It, that doesn't need saying amongst other Indigenous people, but it probably is something that non-Indigenous people perhaps need to be reminded of, that actually when you work in that creative practice, it's not just about creating for the you know for a for a profession or a calling it is actually a much more deeply rooted um, history of whether it's story is this a storytelling format it's a the creation of possum cloaks or whatever it is that there is actually a larger tradition that we have an, an obligation uh, to uh, you know to continue to practice that keeps our not just our culture strong but keeps the fabric of our community strong as well so performance, of course, has been impacted, as, as many would know, and, um, and in a way also um, visual arts has been impacted, closing of galleries, also because um, of the large interest from um, overseas visitors in Indigenous um, art and in, in Indigenous um, cultural uh, practices as well, that that's actually also been a huge impact. But I think also to... Um, yeah, that, I should say there are also similar concerns that funding packages that have come in to support the arts, which have been in this country incredibly small. In fact, I think it's clear uh, to, and, and would not be the first, it's, it's been said by many other people, the underfunding and the failure to support the arts and the failure to support the universities has been part of an ideological response to COVID, um, using COVID as a, as a, as a, um, a method to um, undermine um, a dissent in a, in, a, in a different way and you put that side by side with the um, with the um, situation that Alison talks about in terms of active protests. This is actually quite a virulent attack on Indigenous voice and, and voices of dissent generally. So um, funding packages when they have come down have not tended to trickle down to small to medium 
uh, practitioners. Um, a lot of people weren't eligible for the, um, the, the JobKeeper employment packages that came out because they're self-employed, um, various different, different uh, reasons why, but there was, there's certainly been evidence that, that, is, that um, people within those industries, the creative industries have not been well protected. And, um, you know, almost a sense that, um, you know, if people fail, well, so be it. Um, and, and that has meant that smaller community-based practitioners have suffered the most and, and people who are self-employed have suffered the most in that. Um, but again, I want to go back to the concept of resilience. I think what we have seen as well as I think many of us have actually, in, in terms of the, um, the personal impact of what we've gone through. I mean, nobody's been untouched by the, the disconnection from family, community, country, changes around us. Particularly, I think a large concern has been about our, our parents and grandparents and the elders in the community um, that, that actually I think many of us have, have been reminded of the importance of cultural practices as, as um, uh, part of our, our well-being. Um, part of, you know, I think some people say it's therapeutic. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's about spiritual self-care. I think it's about, you know, cultural connection and resi the, the resilience that we admire so much in our, in our elders. I think many of us have, have looked at it. I know, know for myself, it's been a period of re-engagement with creativity, perhaps because the world's a bit slower and I've been able to appreciate some of, some of uh, the, the time to do that. And, uh, and I think that's really important as well. I think uh, in this one way, um, as my final observation, we will go through a period of rebuilding after this. I mean, we will find our institutions change, the way we work has been changed, the, the, just, you know, this, the, the chasm between rich and poor has been heightened, the haves and the haves not has been heightened. There are real questions being asked now more loudly about uh, structural inequality, structural racism, um, and, you know, I think in, in those discussions of thinking about what kind of society we rebuild, um, Indigenous storytelling, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous understanding of place is going to become ever more important. Um, and I think in the context of remembering, because it's hard to remember after COVID that we went through a summer of intense bushfires that, that, that were really, um, you know, nature giving us a wake up call. There isn't, I think a broader engagement now with the broader from the broader population of perhaps finally realizing that when a culture is able to sustain itself on a country for over 65,000 years, there are probably a thing or two to learn about uh, sustainability, relationships and governance from those communities. And, you know, I hope that uh, in that, in that rebuilding, um, the resilience and strength of Indigenous cultures plays a key part of that. So I'm just going to finish there and, and, and perhaps this is a moment I, I did speak in a space that I know Alison's been really active in and just maybe give her a chance. No, nothing to say. <laughs> okay. No, I'm happy to yarn on it. I mean, um, it's been interesting in the arts watching um, the transformation of preferred in-person engagement to moving kind of to our online community. Um, and something that is um, beautiful, although maybe not profoundly about law and justice about that, uh, is the, the very specific ethos of online cultures for mob at the moment have been on caring for one another um, and doing that caring through creative practices. Um, if anyone here wants to, I'm a rusted on cynic, but even this melted my heart. Um, going to see the karaoke hashtag on Twitter, um, where if you'll please offer me a little bit of grace and ignore how terrible my singing is, um, you can see mob coming together um, to practice at times beautiful, at times deliberately terrible art um, in order to, to build one another up, especially with mob um, down in Melbourne who are struggling with a much harder lockdown than we're facing up here. Um, so we're already in the process of rebuilding. I think I very much agree with Larissa um, because we're so attuned <laughs> to the process of having to, to build and rebuild um, according to the circumstances that are thrust upon us. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Larissa, for a very um, 
fearing critique, but also I, I appreciate, and we see it here um, in Aotearoa too, um, these that you've, you have both emphasised the exercise of sovereignty and of the resilience of um, Indigenous communities in the face of COVID. So um, we can draw some strength from um, those really positive, positive um, examples of yeah, our communities leading the charge and taking care um, of our communities in the face of um, in, in Australia, federal and state and territory governments, which are dropping the ball and have been dropping the ball um, yeah, since they came to be, really. Um, so I, it's open now for us to have a bit of a discussion. I might pose um, a couple of questions to you both, but otherwise, if you, you're welcome to just jump in if you want to add something to another person's response or if you've got questions um, for one another, um, then please feel free to do it. It's pretty relaxed and informal, this part. Um, but I wondered, I might pick up with you first, Alison, you mentioned when you were speaking that at least in the beginning, there was some difficulty garnering attention for some of the criminal justice issues that were being raised. Um, and I wonder, given the gravity of some of the, um, the realities that you mentioned, like, um, seized upon that idea of having um, youth in um, solitary confinement purportedly, you know, for their own safety to, as, a, as a means of isolating them. Um, how much exposure are those issues getting in the mainstream media over in Australia right now? Yeah, they're getting um, um, some degree of coverage. When it happens, as um, speaking of the, the youth prisons example in particular, where some young people are being put in solitary um, and most of the others are being kept in their cells mm -hmm. in effectively um, solitary by another name. Mm -hmm. um, it's been uh, advocates who have been inside, um, potentially most of the time legal advocates, who've been able to bring the account um, outside and make sure it gets covered. I want to credit especially the work of Debbie Kilroy at Sisters Inside, who's been instrumental in doing this uh, for youth prisons in Brisbane in particular, where there was um, perhaps the most concerning outbreak recently. Um, but otherwise, it's been difficult to get, um, I suppose, attention on a, a reform agenda. Um, I think it's difficult for anybody to get media about anything right now. Um, but especially with the Clean Out Prisons campaign, where there was um, a very, um, that the point, the plan had eight different, um, I guess, components to it. It was very well thought out. It was systematic. It was centered on what community needed. It was centered on um, what we knew that the Aboriginal community controlled health sector was capable of delivering. Um, but the difficulty in getting, um, I guess, uh, agenda on the table aside from just covering the atrocity of what's happening in prison is that there was a lot of interest in knowing what was going on inside, um, but a lot of difficulty in controlling the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a major transparency issue um, in prisons on this continent. Um, there's quite, even in the coroner's court, quite a bright, broad use of suppression and non-publication orders that kind of um, on security grounds, but um, stop people from seeing the reality of prisons and how they operate in the day to day. And it was already difficult to get people, journalists, um, observers into prisons in the first place and COVID's only really escalated, I guess, um, that opacity that prisons have. So it's been difficult to tell the story in a compelling way. And that um, kind of subjects Australian media to the sources that they can reliably get access to, which is most of the time corrective services. And so that's allowed particular narratives to seep into the Australian public consciousness, um, like that the, the main concern that prisoners have at the moment, people in prison have at the moment, uh, is that they can't get access uh, to drugs through visitation, um, which has not been substantiated at all outside of what corrective services will tell us. Um, and this uh, was, although is not any more intense speculation around April that um, mail services would be stopped inside to prevent drug trafficking as well. Um, and that was a similar narrative that was raised um, at the protest, the Black Lives Matter protest in Long Bay Prison. Um, the narrative that was pushed by corrective services there was that um, this was a riot over drugs. So it has 
been quite difficult to control the narrative on this and to be able to convey to people the horror of what's happening, even when we're talking so openly about how um, difficult it is to be locked down, even in our own homes, um, the, the compassion, the empathy, um, but also the critical foresight of what that would mean doubly if you were in prison and haven't seen anyone since March. Um, it's just not really happened. Mm. Yeah, like you point out, Alison, you would hope that this um, collective ind Indigenous and non-Indigenous every people experience of being in lockdown would provide an entry point into kind of, uh, yeah, it's not the same, but a small entry point into understanding that, yeah isolation and removal and the effects on well-being that can um, go along with it. So, mm. Thank you. Um, and Larissa, I was, um, like I mentioned um, before, like really excited to hear you talk about um, the, the powerful role that were pay, played by um, Indigenous community over in Australia. So you talked about some of the community controlled health organisations and community controlled councils who were really um, leading the charge and locking down communities and um, ensuring that they were um, kept safe. I wonder, like, just wondering whether uh, the federal, state and territory governments were interfering with the work of those organisations? Were they just either ignoring them and um, or, or just kind of not paying attention to the issue at that stage? Like, what, what Wait, were they I think in fairness, um, I don't think any of the state governments or federal, federal governments, it's really more a state issue, um, worked against them. I, but I think that they were just thinking more broadly. I don't think that they necessarily prior, prioritised or had the ability to to move as quickly as the communities did. It, it, what, from what I saw, communities, communities moved and the state governments fell into line it's what I, I saw and yeah let's see Alison nodding good I'm not I wasn't crazy and, and you know sort of having the chance to you know we we work with a range of communities across the country that are remote as at Oak Valley but we do a lot of work with Borroloola as well in the Gulf so it was a similar thing that that I, I think in a way people people when they're they're so self-determining they don't wait for the government they just do what they're going to do and 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 at least it was consistent where you know where the real lag was too is where the government's responsible still has responsibility for things and the community can't control it mm -hmm. um that 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 you could really see the communities hit up against that but anything they could control themselves they were doing really quickly mm -hmm. um and, and thank god really um yeah 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 really interesting to hear i know um you mentioned about um, the impacts on um, being able to uh, perform cultural practice and um, engage in ceremony um, where it requires being in person. But then also, Alison, you've mentioned these um, contemporary ways that we can connect with one another and express culture through song, such as your um, Kuru karaoke. Uh, I wonder. Um, if there are any other kind of examples that you can think of, of um, these kind of creative displays of working around um, this, this new reality, either from your own community or just um, personally that you've seen. I think I saw um, Larissa on your um, radio program that there had been some, like a digitization of the marketplace for some kind of artists and that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's been a bit of innovation about about that, and and certainly, I think people being very uh, spurred, you know, sort of spurred to be entrepreneurial because of you know a, a huge economic crisis as well. Um, and you know, I think there has been a, a sense of innovation, and you know, I I, I think it's um, a great moment to remember that there's often a myth that Indigenous people don't use technology, but we've, we're always really early adapters of and, and adopters of, of technology. I mean, you go out to Borroloola and all the kids shoot and cut film on their phones. Um, you go out into the, you know, the, the range of programs across the country. Um, they're using iPad tracking technology, GPSs to do, you know, to do traditional caring for country. Um, there are, you know, I think, I think it's a, a space where, um, you know, this is a time where the innovation that we've often had in the space that I don't, I don't, I don't know why people assume 
that we don't have that kind of adaptability because we've been nothing but adaptable. But, uh, you know, obviously there are prejudices and views that seem to think that we're, we're incapable. Access to technology is a different issue, but actually being able to adopt the technology. And, you know, I, I don't want to give too much away, but you can get very caught up on TikTok watching. You, <laughs> watching. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a bit of a confession, but, you know, I just find seeing young, you know, young people dancing, getting the message out, being political, expressing themselves. You know, you, you can look at those platforms. We've got we've got a presence in all of them and use that in a way that talks about culture, self-expression. And, and then the, the hard issues that we're looking at, so youth suicide, deaths in custody. Um, so I sort of, you know, in a way, the, the markets is, you know, is, is great. And, you know, I think that the thing about it that is so, you know, is so worthy of embracing. And, and as Alison says, you know, there's all these ways we're thinking about how we mix these things of the, the in-person experience, but then being able to access people who maybe aren't as mobile or can't travel. Um, you know, having the, the, uh, a market that is in one physical place and now have us all being able to get online and access and see performance. Of course, it's not the same as being there in real not life, but I think there's a mix now where we're thinking about, you know, what's the balance between doing some of our activities so we get that personal connection, that, that, that interface, get off the Zoom for a while, <laughs> but also being able to reach people that aren't so mobile, that, you know, can't get there, that, you you know, might be of that country, but can't be on that country. I, I feel like there's a range of opportunities that we're looking at and because we're resilient, as we've said, I, you know, I, I think these are things that we're, we're taking as opportunities to learn and, and think differently about how we might continue to be, you know, be generating culture in the future. Mm. I think especially in the face of that, um, the mainstream media, as Alison was talking about, kind of failing to pick up on the issues that are important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples. You've got to use the platforms that are accessible to you to do that, to get your message out there. Um, so we are probably just about out of time now, but if you want to make any final comments or remarks, please feel free to jump in. Good, okay. Um, so. Yeah, again, thank you both um, so much, Alison and Larissa, for taking the time to speak with us today. Really um, important corridor from both of you, highlighting um, the repressive actions of the police and the criminal justice system um, and the failures and inactions of government, but then celebrating um, the powerful contributions that are made by the community organisations in Australia, um, the expressions um, and articulations of sovereignty and self-determination that we see, I think, um, are exciting, even in the face of um, the crisis that we're in and responding to this um, pandemic. So um, thank you uh, to both of you. Um, as a, a very small koha or gift to you, um, we are donating some money to a native tree planting program here in Aotearoa. So you will both each have a, a native tree planted in your name. Um, just, oh, amazing. Uh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we come and visit the tree when the borders please? are open? <laughs> <laughs> when we can fly again, we would love to see you. Um, um, we've missed, I know, I. I've missed a lot of our Maori friends. It's, you know, we always keep in touch, but when you can't actually get there and be on country, um, you do feel it. So we're looking forward to coming over and being together again. Yeah, we can't wait to be able to welcome you here to Aotearoa again. So yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to close us um, with uh, a short karakia um, and then we can sign off. Okay, so karakia mutunga. A uh, unuhia unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te ngākau, te tīnana, te wairua i te ara takata, koia rā i rongo, whakairea ake ki runga, ka tīna, tīna, huie, tāiki e. Uh, kia ora koutou.